Can you do the Superman, the Superman theme? I grew up with that theme, Gordon. Right. Did, can you do Star Wars? Did, 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 um, no, uh, oh, see, I've got Superman in my head. And ah! the <laughs> you see, it's difficult. It is difficult. An American one again. We are, you know, we were recording this, Gordon. You know, <laughs> I just hit the record button by are mistake. We? So, yes. right. So, the American national anthem. Hum it. The French national anthem. Oh, um. <laughs> <laughs> then Superman and Star Wars. So this what's, is the what's new the game. French national anthem. French. Um. No, that's America. <laughs> so the French is. Now do America. Right, now do Superman. Star Wars. I'm out. I, I'm out, Gordon. <laughs> I'm just going to say, <laughs> episode <laughs> nine. <laughs> It's difficult. It, Try it at home, folks. Episode 9, and that's not of Star Wars, that's of Whiskey Unscripted. Why on earth are we doing an Ashland Anthems? Well, well, we're, we've got a little bit of a... We're moving around the world. We're going to... We, we, we thought, obviously, with what's been going on in America, um, with, obviously, the, the, the election, and the, we thought, what a great time to talk whiskey from across the pond. Yes. Now, I have a confession to make, Gordon. Yep. I've never been. You've never been to America? I've never been to America. As much as Neil Diamond sings about it, um, and as much as he tells me to go, I've never I've never followed his advice. I've never been. I want You've to never go. never did a summer, summer, summer camp or been to... Uh, no, no, been Camp to Rock. To Disneyland. No, no, no. They wouldn't let me in, uh, no, sadly. So I would love to go. And it's a subject, as I, I, I was saying when we discussed this just over a coffee, Gordon, that we get this asked a lot uh, on the... On the touring when you're going round Glen Goyne with mm. American people always want to know what's the difference and I'd love you yes. to get right into a real uh, conversation oh, about right. American whiskey what types are there what is the main difference between ourselves and them and how did it all come about but who's your guest well today we are going to be speaking with Preston Van Winkle oh. of Van Winkle bourbon fame which is um Probably one of the most sought-after bourbons, one of the most difficult to get a hold of. And he's going to give us a little bit of a background on his family, a little bit of background on Van Winkle, the brand, and how that came about, and why it is now one of the most sought-after bourbons in the land. If you've ever drunk one, you'll know maybe why. Um, so, yeah, I know I know the Van Winkles well. They're good friends of mine, so it was great to get them on Whiskey Unscripted. And as a result of that, we thought, let's have a... Uh, for one of a better word, a deep dive or a bit of a dive yep. or just a swim around um, the land of American whiskey. I think it's great, Gordon. So we'll maybe leave some of the regular features that we do in Whiskey Unscripted for another day. But my first question to you is, how do you know the Van Winkle family? <laughs> well, it's... Um, it's, it's a bit of a long story, but I used to work for Whiskey Magazine. And when I was working with Whiskey Magazine, I used to, I was in charge of sort of commercial development and revenue from the USA. So I used to travel to the States. And obviously from the States, there was, you had the Scotch guys in the States who had budgets and things that we spoke to on a regular basis for any of our US activities. And you had all the bourbon guys. Um, and all the bourbon guys were generally based in Kentucky, funnily enough. So I used to go to Kentucky probably three, two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. And as a result of, you know, working with, uh, you know, for Whiskey Magazine, they used to go around all the distilleries from, uh, you know, sort of Wild Turkey to Four Roses to Buffalo Trace and to uh, Blanton's and to, uh, to um, Van Winkle and Beam and all these different places to... Uh, speak to them about opportunities with the magazine and things. So, so I got to meet all these great people that work in Kentucky, and I and I haven't been to Kentucky for a few years, but I used to drive around Kentucky probably two or three times a year. It was great, great place to visit, and and as a result of that, wow. I learned a lot about bourbon, and um, I loved bourbon. Well, that's what we would like to get right into, Gordon. Um, yeah. Bourbon and that's 
and I should just say at the moment, um, for, if you've just joined us in Whiskey Unscripted and you've never listened to, uh, to this before, we are producers. We do work for a, a family business, uh, Ian McLeod uh-huh. Distillers. Uh, we don't make any bourbon, of course, because we make Scotch whiskey. Um, yeah. But we're a family business. And the is it fair to say that bourbon or American whiskey, are there family businesses out there? Or is it all big business? No, of course. I mean, most some of the big brands are now big businesses but actually if you if you're honest um yeah, i mean let's look at the very big brands now jack daniels is technically not a bourbon because they don't really want to be a bourbon they're a tennessee whiskey does jack daniels conform to the rules of bourbon yes so it could be a bourbon should it want to but it's a tennessee whiskey the biggest american whiskey of them all um is part of the brown foreman group which is a family um mm-hmm. uh so uh, jim beam jim beam is part of beam suntory um, which is a Japanese, still a Japanese family-owned business. So they, I mean, they're big, big businesses, but technically family-owned. I think you're probably talking of slightly smaller family-owned businesses. And actually, if you actually even move out of bourbon land and you move, there's so many craft distilleries and so many interesting uh, distilleries in the States that are producing a wide range yeah. of whiskeys, not Real just bourbon. Stuff, Gordon, I've been, I know we're doing this, I've been doing my research as well, but mm. can I just get you back to basics? We're going to talk about, we've done this in the past, myth-busting mm. for Scotch oh, whiskey. I love a bit of myth You've mentioned Tennessee whiskey, then you've mentioned bourbon. Um, yeah. A, what's the difference? And B... Can you make bourbon? Is it ha- does bourbon have to be made in Kentucky? Right. Let's do a bit of myth busting. Myth busting. Bourbon can be made absolutely anywhere in the states. Right. Okay. That's a myth. Um, I don't think people really know. No. But ninety ninety percent plus of bourbon is made in Kentucky. It's the sort of spiritual home of Kentucky, but it doesn't have to be made in Kentucky. And there's so many distillers and, and, and new distilleries around the around the states making bourbons and ryes and other types of whiskies that um, you know there's there's the, you know it doesn't have to be in Kentucky but certainly uh, the spiritual home of bourbon is Kentucky. And to become um, a bourbon whiskey, Gordon, you have to um, follow the, rules. There's a few rules that you have to follow, um, like you do in Scotch. Um, uh, you have a thing called a mash bill when you make. Um, bourbon and it has to contain so that's the grain makeup at the beginning of the production has to contain at least 51 percent corn sweet corn corn maize Mm -hmm. um, is has to be an element of the grain whereas obviously with single malt for example 100 percent malted barley so we don't have a mash bill in single malt but where we do in in scotch if we think about it is we probably do have a mash bill when we make um when we make grain whiskey, which we would use for blending, we would probably use predominantly wheat, for example, mm-hmm. in Scotland. But we also use a hint of malted barley because and 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 so yeah, you you need the enzymes in malted barley. They're really important. So actually, you have a hint of malted barley in the mash bill in a bourbon as well. Now, I you've mentioned already rye whiskey, so I had some rye whiskey from Finland last episode, if you yep, remember. Yep. So yep. there, there's bourbon, but that's different. You've mentioned Tennessee whiskey, and then you've mentioned rye whiskey. So mm. that's just well, a bit of mash bills. Or what other yeah, whiskeys so rye... are out there before we begin talking about? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a whole. Ra- I mean, there's, there's a lot to talk about. A standard bourbon has about seventy percent corn, fifteen percent rye, and maybe fifteen percent corn. That's a fairly standard mash bill. Um, and so you get the sweetness of the corn, you get the spicy pepperiness of the rye. And you get the importance of the enzymes from the malted barley that help us change, uh, you know, help us create the sugars that we need to then ferment. The same as scotch, the same as making Mm -hmm. anything, you need to ferment the sugars. So that is what the role of the malted barley is predominantly in that mash bill. If you then go to produce a 100% rye whiskey, you have no malted barley in there. So actually, sometimes you may have to, or you may have to add enzymes to allow that, to allow that fermentation ultimately to happy, happen further down the line. Yeah. So um, there's a whole range of. I mean, it's 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 quite complicated to talk about here, but you can get 100% corn whiskey. Um, you can get, uh, and there's rules then come in about casks and how you use them. But it, let's stick to bourbon at the moment. Okay, but, bourbon, there, but just just to put the full stop in this one Gordon they yeah. are making single malts across in America oh, yeah. as well yeah, they can make a single malt in they can make a single malt 
you can make a single malt anywhere you want, yeah. but does it can what rules does it conform to? Are there rules for single malt in Japan? No, clearly not. Or is there rules for single malt in in uh, America? No, not particularly. But the, what they will do is they will put it into casks and make their own variety of single malts. They probably won't use peat because it's not so inherent over there. Um, but yeah, you can make single malt there. Um, but where the rules are really strong is across the sort of more traditional American style products, which are obviously bourbon, corn, rye, whiskey, things like that. Right. So, we'll so bourbon, bourbon. I'll just yeah. maybe a little time. I like my history, Gordon. So I do a little bit of yeah. research as well. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And we've uh -huh. celebrated, um, I just thought the year that changed whiskey, well, we'll give it a small twist on uh, the American theme. I just had a, a little look at it there. And we did celebrate this year 400 years of the Mayflower. Did you catch that? Mm, no, it, it, it actually passed me by. It, it did actually, didn't it? In all the yeah. pandemic, 1620, uh, the yeah. Pilgrim Fathers landed in America and that's what, you know, the Thanksgiving after the first year. Mm -hmm. But did you know there'd been several attempts at doing that previously? And this attempt survived because they brought brewers with them. People that could make uh. alcohol. And of course, when you had alcohol on your side, you didn't need to drink the local water, you could survive. So that's really the, the foothold in America was through the uh, brewing industry. And it didn't take long for brewing to become distilling. And really, there's not many definitive dates, Gordon, in the story of American whiskey, but one that I love, because I'm a big fan of the musicals. I don't know if you've seen mm -hmm. Hamilton on the West End stage, my boy. Or indeed on Disney Plus about the life of Alexander Hamilton, uh, George Washington's yeah. right hand man, who in 1791 suggested to George Washington that he should maybe tax whiskey um, to get back the, the war debt after fighting the War of Independence against Britain. And of course, yeah. it was duly enacted in 1791. And did it go down well, Gordon? I'm not sure, did it? No, <laughs> down very badly. Oh, dear. Uh, very badly, yes. Tax inspector, one of the tax inspectors, I forget his name, in 1791 was taken off his horse, stripped naked, tarred and feathered, and left in the middle of a forest. So that was really the first salvo of what they thought of this new whiskey tax. It rumbled on for four years, and it threatened the very country that had fought you know, against the British. It really threatened the... Um, fabric of the American, new American nation. They had to drop it and um, George Washington set an army first and then they had to get sorted. But the Whiskey Rebellion, quite amazing, Gordon, how at the beginning of their nationhood, whiskey was right at the heart of it, causing problems with taxation. But really, yeah. you know, when you look at the history of it all, it was the European settlers that brought the knowledge with them when they started the moving west uh, and brought their, their crops and what was there was what was distilled. And it was really mostly rye. Uh, and then slowly corn started popping up and bourbon became bourbon in the early 1820s. And the story of, of course, the big story in America is Prohibition. The big 1919 experiment, the Volstead Act. So it's an amazing, um, I'm not going to get into all the details, an amazing history of distilling in America. And I think there's about 2,000 distilleries there just now, Gordon. So not really a specific yeah. date, but just a little look at the history. Oh. No, it's a, it's an amazing. Uh, it has an amazing history. A lot of people think it's not as old as um, as um, you know Scotch, but you forget actually the diversity of whiskey in America is huge. Yeah. The diversity of bourbons um, is pretty big. The diversity of you know rye and you know all across from you know from the west to the east coast, um, north to south, there's great whiskeys made across the across the whole of the continent of america any worth um, any, any anyone worth picking out in particular well, well of course with the van winkles coming on van winkles of course but no look i mean one i i'm i'm a big fan of uh quite a few different products there was a if we look at sort of this the, the bourbon industry you, you know you've got jack daniels and jim beamer blazing the trail um uh, uh, sort of globally um and then maker's mark is probably uh, a very a big growing distillery. I was there not that long ago, and it's it's definitely got been getting a lot yeah. bigger. So they're the sort of three big ones that you would think of. Then the other major ones: Buffalo Trace, Four Roses, Wild Turkey, a few others that you would that, that you would sort of mention in, in that sort of breath. Seventeen ninety two is a great product as well. So yeah, there's 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 quite a lot. Bardstown, Ken, Bardstown, Kentucky. I've stayed there many times. That's sort of the centre where they hold the uh, bourbon festival. Now but then you look at... Just what's about to say, Gordon, because we've got the Speyside festivals and mm. we've got that lovely trail up in Speyside. Yeah. You can walk and go into all the distilleries and the wonderful... Now, there's a bourbon trail or the Kentucky... 
There is trail? the Kentucky Trail, yeah. Oh, there is the Bourbon we'll Trail. That. You can do that through the through the sort of you go down the Bluegrass Parkway, which yes. is the main sort of road, and you can go to uh, you can go to all these different bigger distilleries. There's smaller distilleries now. There's distilleries within Louisville as well. Louisville much more the Ken, much more the Bourbon City than um, uh, Lexington, which is probably a little bit more horse racing. Uh, that's really what Kentucky, Kentucky's famous for yes, bourbon horses and chicken. I did go to a KFC in in Kentucky just because I felt I had to. Oh yes. And it was, was it the, the same fairly disappointing experience was as it? it was in most places. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had the colonel. You know, I don't know. Well, no, I just thought it might be better in yes, Kentucky, yeah, but yeah. funnily enough, it wasn't. Um, but uh, yeah, that's quite a quite a. Yeah, I mean, it's a great, great part of the world to visit. And uh, I've got some really good friends out there. It'd be great to get back out there at some point. But, you know, you go to these distilleries and you understand why they make it differently to scotch and that, you know, how important certain things are that that are not as important to to scotch. So, for example, because we mm-hmm. can use a huge variety of casks in scotch, then generally across Scottish production of single malt if we just talk about single malt yeasts yeasts are not they're not a huge i mean there is an element of it but they're not a huge part of the flavor generation what you do look in bourbon is if you go to beam or you go to maker's mark or you go to four roses um they use different yeasts because you know each distillery uses different yeast because that's the yeast they've produced and it helps them really 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 start to drive their own style and then it's they're distilled very differently as well so actually distilled in a column still so we've spoken about that before but initially it's distilled in a column still and then generally um it's sort of put through a small pot still doubler which just increases the strength a little bit that's how well, that's most bourbons are used is that right how did that all that come around or is that a general principle column first pot second um, not not everybody does it that okay. way. Um, they're, 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 you know, Woodford Reserve, for example, just uses pot stills and triple distills. So, that, and that's part of Brown Foreman. So that, that you know, there's there is a a variety of different ways. But actually, what you understand is how important your ratios of grain are to the flavour. So, for example, Jim Beam produced a, wh- a whiskey called Basil Hayden's, which is a much more rye forward bourbon. So the percentage of rye has increased from maybe 15 to 30 percent. Um, Maker's Mark actually takes the rye out and replaces it with red winter wheat. The reason I talk about Beeman Makers, I used to work for them, so I know them a little bit more than others. Um, so there's a, there is variation around there. The one thing that is consistent across all bourbons is the fact they use the same casks, which are yeah. 200 litres American oak, charred on the inside for 45 seconds to a minute generally, and they are they produce a consistent maturation. The one thing that makes a lot of difference is where you position them in their massive warehouses. So they have these really tall warehouses which are nine stories high. Each story has three casks, so they're 27 casks high. And so where you then position casks in the hot summers and the cold winters really can make a big difference to your bourbon. And do they rotate, Gordon? They can turn casks. They do They, they do turn casks, um, not all of them, but they or do move, move around. casks around. And, and and the biggest thing I remember learning was if, if they're trying to make a standard bourbon and they're, they're using it from warehouses, they will take cuts diagonally from top left to bottom right and top right to bottom left across a warehouse to, to make yeah. sure that you get a range of different casks that you then combine together to give you an element of consistency and to make sure the batches taste the same. That is absolutely... For anybody listening to Gordon, it's an absolute masterclass you're delivering here on the American uh, bourbons uh, on whiskey. They are absolutely, really fascinating. I'm getting quite in, in, interested. I'd love to um, sit down with a little dram and listen yeah. to Preston yeah. Van Winkle here. Could you... Um, what you have? Yes. Well, I am having... I have... Haha. <laughs> I wish I wish I could say I have a little bit of uh, Van Winkle, but I don't. So I'm actually drinking a... Four Roses. Now, Four mm-hmm. Roses is a really interesting brand. It's owned by the Japanese. I went there about 12, 13 years ago with a good friend of mine who I've not seen for a while, Jim Rutledge, who has started, he was the master distiller at that point. He started up his own bourbon company in the last couple of years. But he, uh, uh, Four Roses does it very differently. They create um, 10 different bourbons from 
you know, they use different yeasts and different mm -hmm. recipes. So they have different recipes, different yeasts that they use, which com 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 culminates in 10 different styles of bourbon, which they can use. And they obviously use an element of these in their standard four roses, but they produce them. Um, they've all got funny initial names. And if you can ever look at them, it's all on their website. But um, and I had this masterclass on how important yeast was, how important the recipe change was. And you were sat there and you tasted the difference between these bourbons, all matured in similar casks. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. And it shows you the impact of that. Um, so that was a really interesting one. So I've got a little, just a standard Four Roses, uh, great whiskey, nice sipping bourbon. I'm just having a little sip on that. That sounds absolutely fantastic. I have not got a bourbon, Gordon, but I am going to make myself a small cocktail, I think. Um, I've got a Glengoyne 12, so there's a, some bourbon cask in that. And yeah. I think I might try and see, I've got some sugar syrup I've made up. And I'm going to try and just make myself a very basic mint julep. Um, uh, a little nice. cocktail from the Prohibition era. Would that be, would that be quite nice? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, you know, you forget about the influence of prohibition, and and uh, you and and Preston will talk about this. You forget about the influence of prohibition on bourbon as well, and why how that shaped the current bourbon industry. Yes. What Preston will also talk about is how the probably 25, 30 years ago, bourbon was not perceived to be premium at all. It was a buy it in 1.75 bottles, pay nothing for it, make no money for it, and. Uh, and drink it type thing but now bourbon is much more prestigious in a general sense and you can still get great bourbons at a at a, at a you know a good price as well so um so so it's it's the the premiumization of bourbon has been huge um and is really really important to uh you know if, if they're making great bourbon that's good for us in the scotch whiskey industry because um, we use their gas. casks and once yeah, they've absolutely. used them well i don't have much ice gordon but i'm certainly it's very refreshing a lovely julep um, Very nice. Um, takes me back to my speakeasy days. Uh, Gordon, so here we go. Yeah. Um, Gordon Dundas meets Preston Van Winkle. So on Whiskey Unscripted, we now have a good friend of mine, um, f live from Kentucky, Preston Van Winkle. How are you, sir? I'm well, Gordon. Good to speak to you. Very good to speak to you. And I'm very, very upset. I haven't seen you for so long, you and your, your father a, and everybody. But, a minute. Um, <laughs> I know, it's been, it's been a heck of a year. How has COVID been for you this year? uh <clears throat> up and down yeah um kind of you know pretty used to used to it now at this yeah. point yeah. um as far into it as we are mm -hmm. um but kind of running out of things to do with the weather getting ready to change it's um <laughs> i'm a little nervous about being cooped up in the house and not being able to get out and go for bike rides and hikes and whatnot yeah and far less even that from a you know if you think about what we do we work in the whiskey industry from that perspective it's a it's a social industry it's a social event no obviously i guess um kentucky bourbon festival this year it just makes you sort of really sort of understand how what a great industry we work in doesn't it yeah it's um it is an amazing industry and i, I'm, I certainly miss the um miss the events that we've done in the past and yeah. had planned for this year and uh, early next year so um i but mostly i you know i feel for the people in kind of our you know in our same hospitality sphere yeah absolutely the, the bar and restaurant owners and yeah absolutely the, those folks that are suffering immensely yeah i mean i know that you're at you're obviously in kentucky where probably things are not quite as locked down as they are in europe but we were looking quite good in the summer um and then it's all gone a bit unfortunately a bit wrong at the moment and uh you know, pretty much across Europe, things are fairly tightly locked down. And, and as you say, we, 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 you know, we rely so heavily on our hospitality partners and uh, we just wish them all the best in this difficult time for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we first met many years ago when I was working for Whiskey Magazine, which was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> and I used to come over to the Bourbon Festival. And I think that's probably where we met with a whole load of mutual friends, as it were, that jovial time and obviously i i first stumbled across your bourbons then and was 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 taken but this is probably back in 2005 something like that very much taken with them as a style of bourbon and can you give people just a bit of background to you know the the, the wonderful sort of van winkle name and and and, and the, the the bourbons yeah so um my family got our start in the the bourbon business back in 1893 with my great grandfather, uh, just working as a, a whiskey salesman uh, here in Kentucky. Um, 
he sold uh, out of a horse and buggy <laughs> and um, sold all over the state and into Ohio and um, yeah. southern Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, and even down into Texas once he got a, uh, a motor car and um, started traveling by train a lot as well. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but they were selling, uh, this was the W.L. Weller & Sons Wholesale House, yeah. um, another famous famous brand name, um, and they were selling whiskey made for them by the Stitzel Distillery. Um, so the, the two brands that they were um, most apt to push were W.L. Weller and Old Fitzgerald. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he, uh, he and another Weller salesman bought controlling interest in the Weller Wholesale Company about 10 years later, uh, 1903, mm-hmm. and uh, a couple years after that bought controlling interest in the Stitzel Distillery. And uh, just operated those two businesses independently of one another, making whiskey at Stitzel for the Weller Wholesale Company. Right. And um, when Prohibition began in 1919, that pretty much ended the Weller Wholesale business. Um, The Stitzel Distillery was one of a handful of distilleries given a a license by the U.S. federal government to produce medicinal whiskey. So you could go to your (laughs) pharmacy and... Uh, or go to your doctor and get a prescription a for like bourbon. Freud. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, doctors, certain doctors could prescribe a certain amount of mm-hmm. of product each month. So you could take your prescription to the pharmacy and get your little pint bottle of of whiskey <laughs> with a, a prescription label on the bottle and right. everything. Um, yeah. So those are highly collectible now. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, when prohibition ended in 1933. Uh, yeah, they had stocks of older whiskey to sell, <clears throat> um, so they were they were poised to to jump back in with both feet pretty quickly. So they uh, they started building the modern day Stitzel Weller Distillery in a, a southwest suburb of of Louisville, and um, two years later on uh, Kentucky Derby Day, 1935, they officially opened uh, the distillery. Um, so my family owned and operated uh, that distillery with mm-hmm. um, with this other family, uh, the Farnsleys, and um, Pappy. Uh, Pappy, my great grandfather, was the the figurehead. He was never a distiller. He was just the the brains behind the operation. Van Winkles have never been distillers. We've always just had the good sense to hire the best of the best. <laughs> Uh, to make the whiskey That's for the us. That's the way to do it. That's the way yeah, to do it. exactly. Uh, fewer headaches that way. Yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, Pappy died in 65. Um, my grandfather took over. He had been working for his dad um, since he returned from World War II mm-hmm. uh, in the mid-late 40s. And um, he was forced to sell in 1972. Uh, the bourbon business was not doing very well. Mm. Scotch, uh, rum, vodka, gin, yeah. all were starting to take a bigger foothold in the States. So um, the dividend checks for the rest of the family weren't as good as, as what they would like to have seen, so they forced my grandfather to sell. Um, so he sold off everything with the exception of the old Van Winkle brand, which was a pre-prohibition brand. Yeah. that he had bought off of a friend and didn't do anything with. So he resurrected that brand with, with stocks that were made at Stitzeweller and um, started doing that. And uh, my dad jumped on board with him in 77, the year I was born. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point, my grandfather was starting to get ill. Uh, he died of pr- uh, prostate cancer in 1981. Mm. My dad took over <clears throat> at that point. And was just doing contract bottling, um, having uh, bourbon produced under contract with with a couple distilleries, just buying bulk whiskey on the open market, et cetera, et cetera, um, just trying to keep the lights on. Um, so eventually uh, he created this Pappy brand in the mid-90s um, and in 1997, I think, the uh, Beverage Testing Institute in Chicago that generates a lot of the trade publication reviews that you see um, mm-hmm. gave the Pappy a 99 rating. It was the highest rating ever given to an American whiskey uh, and remains remains that way to this day. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of where 
the phone started ringing again and um, things started picking up, but it wasn't until probably 2005 or six that things went on strict allocation. Yeah. Uh, so I joined up yeah. in 2001. Yeah. Why? Wow. I mean, that's a, it's an incredible sort of, and it sort of also mirrors a little bit, obviously, the, you know, if you think of, as you said, where b the bourbon industry was in the 70s and the 80s, and, you know, not a, not, you know, not a particularly premium product at all, struggling a little bit. Now you look at across, across Kentucky, and even, I mean, I haven't been there for three or four years, and I struggle to keep up with what's going on in Kentucky, but, uh, yeah. you know, there's an amazing array of, of, you know, premium bourbons, bourbon as a, category has brought itself up into this premium more premium position would you would you agree with that yeah so um you know that's kind of what partially put a damper on the the bourbon category in the 60s and 70s and on you know on through the uh, 80s and 90s uh was this perception that bourbon was your grandfather's whiskey it wasn't <laughs> It wasn't a premium product, and the twenty-year-old pappy kind of set the set the industry on its ear. Um, it uh, it it showed that you could have a not just a premium um, premium bourbon, but an ultra premium bourbon that yeah. that would rival a you know a nice single malt. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it it kind of reinvented the category, and now you know they're. And there was nothing that old at that point, not even close, really. Um, yeah. And so, it, you know, all of a sudden you start seeing 15, 18, 20, 22, 25, 27-year-old products pop up all over uh, all over the industry. So, um, Which is, which of course, you know, you, if you think of how bourbon matures in the rack houses and up against newly charred oak is completely different to a equivalent age scotch i mean night and day yeah. difference in terms of far less the fact it's made differently but you know the way that it matures you, you get a lot of influence don't you yeah the new wood combined with the the uh climate in kentucky yeah um especially uh really it's it's three to four it would take three to four years to achieve the same amount of interaction with the wood in scotland as it does in kentucky just simply because of the climate and the yeah you know the the new the virgin oak yeah no as absolutely. opposed to reclaimed barrels or yeah. reused barrels and preston that is because it's <coughs> pissing with rain and cold in scotland most of the time <laughs> whereas in kentucky warm summers cold winters uh it's what mid-november and we're um we're looking at an 80 80 degree fahrenheit day today Gosh, that's, um, a, that's a warm summer's day in Scotland. Yeah, uh, and yeah, you know, this is obviously outside the norm. It's usually yeah. you know half half as warm in November, but um, yeah, we have wild temperature swings here um, mm -hmm. in Kentucky, and uh, you know it may be really hot one day, and it, yeah. it may snow the next, um, and every and everything in between. So that those wild aging conditions really make for. Uh, a good product in yeah. terms of our style of whiskey and you forget absolutely and you forget i mean when you go to kentucky the warehousing is is very unique sort of you know three 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 casks high and nine racks or nine sort of floors um you know it can be quite hot at the top in the summer um, oh yeah quite different in the middle compared to the edges of warehouses warehouses behind ones where the prevailing wind are different oh yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of variety of of maturation that can be achieved because of warehouse position is that not right uh yeah absolutely um where where a barrel is located in the in the warehouse uh has a tremendous amount uh to do with the, the finished product yeah um you know it's it's super hot on the top floor uh, top few floors in the summertime and it may be you know um 20 to 50 degrees cooler Fahrenheit yeah. uh, on the bottom floor. Which and, you know, it's real dry it. around the outside of the warehouse, and it, you know, it could be um, a lot more temperate uh, in the middle, in, you know, in the heart of the warehouse. So it, it does make a big difference. We try to keep our barrels on the lower floors in the heart of the warehouse where the conditions are the most consistent yeah. and least aggressive. 
uh, simply because we are aging them for so long. Again, you mentioned, you know, the, the relative age of, mm. you know, single malt versus bourbon. Yeah. Um, it, it, it makes a big difference when we're, when we're trying to make the trip 15, 20, 23 years. Um, sure. that's just getting warmed up, uh, on your side of the pond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, de- I mean, absolutely right. And, you know, I, I've luckily been to Kentucky many times. I've worked for a bourbon. So, um, you know, I certainly understand a lot of those sort of varieties. The other thing that, the other thing that, you know, obviously with, with, um, bourbon is you can only use the one type of cask. And that's why there's so many ex bourbon casks in scotch and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, how much, and, and, I, and I'm meaning sort of pan industry a little bit more maybe than you or, or than you guys, but how much do you change char levels? Is that something that you do a lot or is that, you know, no. achieve? Not, not particularly? <clears throat> no, we, um, the industry standard is typically generally uh, a number four char. Uh-huh. Um, there are certainly some that, that do a lighter, a lighter char and some that do a heavier, but. Um, I'd say on average it'd be a number four char. Which and is just shy of a minute, is that right? Uh, yeah, typically about a 45, 50 second burn, yeah, yeah. depending on the, the type of equipment you're using. Yeah. Um, there are diff- you know, different, different cooperages have mm. uh, slightly different methods for, for getting that flame going mm. in there. Um, yeah, yeah that, and that's interesting to see too. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I've seen it. I burnt my eyebrows. It was. It, it, <laughs> I mean, it was it's pretty brutal. And, and you know, I actually was just speaking to. So I went to Spain to see sherry cask being being manufactured, yeah. which was, you know, incredible, but certainly not on the scale of how bourbon casks are manufactured. And uh, you know, just just an amazing uh, an amazing thing to see how consistent they are as well. They produce. They're very consistent modern day bourbon casks. Yeah, they really are. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of science injected yeah, yeah. into an art, an art form, just in terms of getting the, you know, getting things as consistent as possible. Yeah. No, definitely, definitely. So, Preston, if we look at Van Winkle as a brand now, it's probably one of the most sought after, I would say, whiskey products in the world. Um, you know, the secondary market has really you know, there's a huge secondary market for your products. And I'm Mm -hmm. intrigued to get a handle on when you think that kicked in and how that affects how you release price products now, if you know what I mean. It's it's an intriguing relationship. Yeah. um, When did that start? Uh, It's been building since. Well, you got all that Van Winkle stolen, didn't you? Yeah, that we had some uh, <laughs> some nicked from the warehouse. Um, How long ago was that? Twenty thirteen, I think. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's been a been a while. It was certainly um, on the go before that, though. Yeah. It was on the definitely. rise. Yeah. So so what do you put definitely. that down to? What I mean, obviously, I know it's great bourbon, and a lot of people out there know it's great bourbon, but there's more to it than that, is there not? I I would like to think so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I would like to think it's more than just hype. I don't think you get to the no, the hype level without the quality behind it. No, that's um, very true. Uh, so, yeah, but it the uh, whole secondary market thing, it, it's just been build, uh, building and building um, to the point where now it affects retail prices. You know, yeah. Retailers are trying not to miss out on, on any dollars. Um, as a result of secondary market pricing, which is frustrating for us because we're not doing this for people to to go flip our products and make a profit. We're doing it for people to drink it and enjoy yeah. it with friends and family. And yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah. So I mean, I remember being at. Um, I think the last time I actually saw you was probably about a year and a bit ago, maybe in Whiskey Fest, San Francisco, or something like mm-hmm. that, which was about. Might even have been two years ago. Anyway, I remember there. Yeah, it's probably two years this month. Yeah, I was. Yeah, uh, those were the days when we could do the things like that. Um, <laughs> and I was there with uh, Glenn Goyne and Tam Do hat on. We were, we were, we were very popular from a single malt perspective. Uh, but all I can remember is before, <laughs> before the, uh, before the show starts, there was these sort of these sort of tapes that you get at airports for. Um, you know, security lines or whatever, the sort of seatbelt type stuff, if the material that you get. And um, it's all outside. I'm like, what's all this for? And it's, uh, 
and I've never seen hundreds of, literally hundreds of people, unfortunately, run past Glen Goyne and Tamdu, straight <laughs> for the Van Winkle booth. And literally, it, I mean, it was, a, it was a camera moment. It was just like, look at these people running towards your products. And it just, it's, it, it's incredible that you produce something that has that demand for it. It's, it, it's incredible. Yeah, it's uh, it's been wild. Um, you know, we're at those whiskey fest or you know whiskey fest shows. Yeah, um, we're the only table with um, stanchions and security. <laughs> and yeah, there is that that mad dash stampede, and they usually stick us in a back corner just yeah. to get us out of the way. Yeah, and also uh, I think um, and also <laughs> just to make sure that they run past everybody else. Yeah, so that they, so they can get, get a lay of the land. <laughs> <laughs> they, can, they can scope out where they're going to go after our table. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, it's absolutely uh, yeah, it's incredible to see. And so what is your, I mean, you, you, you've brought, you, I've, I've seen a couple of partnerships, new releases, things like that. What's what's the current state of play with Van Winkle? What's What's been happening? You're just saying you've got some new stuff coming down the line? Uh, well, we're partners with Buffalo Trace, have been since 2002. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're producing all of our whiskey for us, and and they're producing um, great stuff themselves. As yeah, well, so. so we really, um, yeah. we really lucked out. Uh, Harlan Wheatley, like yeah. I said, um, we um, we find that we seem to find ourselves uh, working with the best master distillers in the world. And Harlan Wheatley, when it comes to uh, mm-hmm. American whiskey, certainly is is. Uh, one of the best, if not the best. I'll tell you a great um, story about Harlan very quick. I know Harlan well. Sure. He, 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 Buffalo Trace, so not you guys were over the hole, but Harlan was next to us on our stand. It must have been it. might even have been New York last year. I can't remember. And, uh, you know, big Chris Comstock, was all, they were all there. Mm-hmm. And Harlan was sort of wandering around, and I went up to him and said, how are you doing, Harlan? He says, ah, oh, how are you? I haven't seen you for ages. I handed him a cheeky Glen Goyne. Uh, of what we produce, and I just left it. Mm-hmm. With me. And he came back at the end of the show. And he went, Gordon, that whiskey you dropped over to me, absolutely fantastic. He said. He said, obviously, not a bourbon, a Scotch, but for a Scotch, he said it was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> so I was like, that's that's praise indeed from one of one of Kentucky's finest distillers. Um, and uh, as you say, yeah, I mean, he's he's he's. I mean, you know him a lot better than me, but he's an amazing uh, an amazing sort of art in what he does. Yeah. He's um, he's extremely talented, so we uh, we're we're lucky to be um, aligned with him. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, and we um, over the years we've done a couple of limited edition releases, um, a twenty three and a twenty five year old decanter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that we did uh, in conjunction actually with Glen Cairn over oh, there yeah. in Scotland, yeah, 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 yeah. and um, one of the they did both of the bottles one of the boxes was made partially from the wood from the the barrels ah, that we nice. used for that project so that was that was fun that was a mm-hmm. that was a tough project but it was uh <laughs> yeah. it was it was fun getting all those pieces together uh the the barrels were shipped from here to north carolina turned into box tops and then completed over at a factory over in north carolina and then getting the the crystal from from scotland and <laughs> The whiskey from Kentucky. It yeah. was, Crikey. it was, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, that, that one took a took a, a little while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh no, I know how long these things take. Yeah, unbelievable. You, you think? But, uh, that, sorry, one, go ahead. One of the things in the whiskey industry is things generally take a little bit longer than you think they're going to take, and uh-huh. uh, that's pretty true of developing new products, things like that. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, so, so there's also a partnership that you've been working on recently. Is that fair? Um. Let's see. Well, we did a um, we did a custom boot for that charity. Was it. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. So Wolverine Boots, they're uh, an American um, work boot company. With they have a, a line of of high end boots, uh-huh. um, like you know, style, more style driven. They hold yeah. up. Um, yeah. But yeah, so we did uh, we did a. A custom boot and I got to help with the design and oh, nice. whatnot and um, yeah so uh, Wolverine sold 300 pairs of boots and um, we donated all the money to the Micro Works Foundation Micro mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. as the guy from that show Dirty Jobs, and uh, oh, yeah. somebody's got to do it. You know, um, so yeah. he's big into trade school versus four-year university. Yeah. Um, so you don't end up coming out of school with a a load of student debt. Um, so yeah, so we raised like 150 or 160 thousand um, dollars, and didn't have to <laughs> didn't have to sell a drop of whiskey. Um, that's all right. Just got to, yeah, yeah it, that, so that was great. Good. That's great. Um, and we're we're bouncing around a few other ideas, uh, primarily just to, um, you know, use our platform to yeah. to raise money for for worthwhile causes. And I know, and I know, obviously, historically, you've done a little bit. I mean, not a lot. I know you don't have a lot of stock, but you you've been doing a little bit of business into Europe. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, obviously, with tariffs and things. Uh, and your lack of stock, I take it, is that still a markets that you're supplying or are you? Are yeah, you... so um, we've had distribution in the UK, France, yeah. uh, Spain off and on, Italy off and on, mm-hmm. uh, Germany, Sweden, um, the Ukraine, apparently. I just found that out <laughs> uh, last month. There you apparently go. We... we sell a bit of whiskey in the Ukraine. They love it over there. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. Um, so we, I mean, it's just a, for the most part, it's kind of a token few cases. Yeah. Uh, the UK is by far our, um, the UK and Canada are our largest export markets. Right. Okay. Um, the UK is, you know, we started developing that business when things were kind of lean in the um, late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. Uh, my father developed a relationship with the wholesaler over there and, Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, kind of built a, a little cult following over there. And, uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately, because it takes so long to add more stock to, mm. uh, the portfolio it um, mm-hmm. we haven't been able to increase allocations much, but, um, yeah. we're still, we're still selling, um, still selling it. Yeah. And, well, uh, that's I actually good. had a trip to the UK canceled, uh, back uh-huh. in May, unfortunately. So. Well, I was meant to probably be in the states now, so uh, yeah, it's it's just the way it is. But I tell you, Preston, when things are uh, things are back to normal, and hopefully we just we're talking as we've just heard a little bit more about a vaccine, which maybe is good news for everybody out there. But uh, um, let's hope things get back to a semblance of normality next year. That would be nice. That sure would. <laughs> I would certainly get to Kentucky because I think it's essential that I come and look at our bourbon cast suppliers and. Uh, uh, all that sort of thing because it's it's a great place to go and when I first went to Kentucky it's probably 2004 2005 and I was struck by actually when you depending on what time a year ago for, for those who maybe don't know Kentucky too well it, it does have this sort of element of that you're driving through Scotland at times if, it, if you're going in sort of September October it does look a little bit like Scotland as a place and it's just wonderful place to visit and you can do the sort of Kentucky trail can't you yeah, it's, uh, you know, there obviously there are certain parts that are nicer looking than others, but yeah, you get those <laughs> lush green rolling fields, and yeah. rolling hills rather. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I've still never made it to Scotland, so. Well, we need to sort that out. We need to sort that out, Preston. We'll get you That was on my out. list for May, but uh, uh, unfortunately that that trip got shot down for obvious reasons, but. Yeah, well, hopefully, if you're if you're if you're coming back to Scotland, we will. If you're coming back to the UK, we'll get you up to Scotland. It would be great to see you. Um, just before I go, Preston, it's been great to get a sort of potted history of of Van Winkle. And firstly, is there any more? Do you have any more sort of amount of stock coming in the coming years that people can maybe access it a little bit easier? Do you think? Or well, I, it's not going to be in, you know it's not going to be a whole lot easier, but we've got more ten and twelve year old than we've ever had, and uh, next year we'll we'll be able to say the same about Great. the fifteen year old, and then obviously five years from then it'll translate to the twenty. Um, okay. And the rye whiskey's back online in a in a very small small way. Um, Great, I so. remember tasting that. That was I had a few bottles of Van Winkle back back in the day, and I can say with pleasure. I enjoyed drinking them all. It was great. Um, and I now have none <laughs> of them. That's fine. Um, <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> I will find. I will seek some out. But uh, yeah, no, it's great. So a couple of things I want to ask you just before we go. 
if I said to you, what is one of your most memorable whiskey moments? If you think about a time that you, um, you know, you were um, just in the zone in terms of the people you were with, where you were, the whiskey you were drinking, um, anything that stands out for you? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> it's probably a few. I, I, yeah. Um, well, you know, after, after Whiskey Fest Chicago, just those nights hanging out. Yeah, Delilah's. Delilah's with, like, yeah, with always whole, good fun. With with the whole gang and um Yeah. You know um I don't know, just you know, the, the post event yeah. kinda a- unofficial after parties at, at Whiskey Fest and Whiskey Live and Yeah, yeah. Um you know, yeah. those, those I, things were always just a lot of fun. Just getting to see, you know, getting to hang out with people from around the industry yeah. that you don't get to see outside of those events um it's always fun you know th- there's obviously some competition the of course. the uh the real competition is with the suits and the bankers and the lawyers <laughs> and stuff but the yeah. the people you know boots on the ground folks um tend yeah. to get along uh industry-wide just fine and, yeah um, scotch bourbon whatever you just get on and you enjoy people's products and you enjoy the company i would absolutely uh concur with that and some of my finest memories are uh as you say, post whiskey shows, post post bourbon festivals, sort of. Uh, uh, I remember doing a few things back at the Hampton Inn in, in the gazebo Spring, party, the gazebo party, and back in, you the know, General with, Nelson uh, Hotel. Yeah, back there. I mean, there's been some interesting things going on, and uh, yeah, it's just the the camaraderie of it. I think is is fantastic. So, Preston, Definitely. it's been it's been a pleasure to talk to you about all things Van Winkle. Um, Likewise, my friend. It, it's been really good to catch up with you. And uh, I hopefully we will see you in 2021. Uh, at some Fingers point. crossed. And I generally will hope to try and get to Kentucky and I hope you get to come to Scotland. Um, and uh, thank Absolutely. you for being on Whiskey Unscripted. Thanks, Gordon. Appreciate it. Good to talk to you. All right. Take care. Cheers. Gordon, that was fantastic. Really, really, really mm. good. Enjoyed that. Oh, yeah. I mean, as I think I said in the interview, I had a lot of, I had quite a lot of Van Winkle about 15 odd years ago bourbon that I just finished and drank, and you know it has become now unbelievably prestigious. Um, and uh, yeah. you know, a g- great, great family, great, great product, and, and working with great people at Buffalo Trace in Harlem Wheatley. So yeah, no, they're uh, they're fantastic. So yeah, I can see you know. Uh, sorry to interrupt there, Gordon, but you can yeah, see why people come across to Scotland and really now whiskey tourism is um, big business and that's a really mm. good reason for planning a trip I'm now thinking I'm dying to get across there and uh, get into the bourbon country and get some oh, it's, you know I'd, boots in the ground I'd strongly recommend it to anybody who wants to go and see whiskey made elsewhere there's you know I've I've been lucky enough to see whiskey being made in Taiwan in Japan in in Finland in all around the all around the world I've not you know, there's certain places I'd love to go and have a look at. Australia and Tasmania is one. Um, more across America, but I have spent a lot of time in Kentucky, and um, it's it's great. And there's some really you'll learn a lot. You can drink great whiskey, um, and there's you know there's some really great diversity. I mean, I never thought I would like rye whiskey. You know, the sort yeah. of demogra- the sort of breakdown of what rye whiskey is is spicy, peppery whiskey. But my eyes was opened by a, a whiskey called Rittenhouse Rye, a whiskey live show that we were running in Glasgow about 16, 15 years ago, something like that. And I drank this Rittenhouse Rye and I was like, oh my God, I had a whiskey epiphany in terms of what that was to me. And, and I think it was part of my opening my eyes and wanting to try different types of whiskey that we see now across the whole range of you know, whiskeys is people don't just drink one type. And so rye whiskey is often, Canadian whiskey is actually often referred to as rye, even though it isn't just historically. But rye whiskey is, you know, 100% that more peppery rye, which can really, uh, I like that. Put, maybe if somebody says that's what it is, it might put you off. But Rittenhouse was at that point just fantastic. And, uh, you know, there's other great ryes. But the diversity is there. And we're now making rye whiskey. There's, there's distillers in Scotland who've made rye whiskey. And, uh, um, you know, I think our Bicky has... Our, our, never say it right but i think they have made a rye whiskey and one or two others mm-hmm. yeah. um and even down in england i think they made a rye whiskey so you know that i love to see this diversity of manufacturing of different whiskies from all over the world and Quite you can exciting. make a you can make a bourbon style whiskey in scotland there's no reason to not you can use a a whiskey distilled from 51 percent corn and you know but you know rye and mm-hmm. uh and uh 
and, and make it in Scotland and put it into virgin oak cask. But it would be a very different style of whiskey because of the temperatures and the difference in the maturation. Uh, I'm sure somebody will have a go at it, anything. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's no re- I mean, I mean, you know, there's absolutely no reason you can't. Um, so it's, it, 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 yeah, and what, they, what they're doing in America is fantastic. And there's been some really pioneering smaller distilleries as well that have done some really interesting stuff like yeah. uh whistle pig have done some really interesting stuff and there's stranahan's and there's 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 um the one in texas that i've completely forgotten its name um, i was about to say which, well i've completely forgotten its name that did that was experimenting with sonic maturation and warehousing um putting you know a deep reverb through speakers to sonically mature their whiskey all sorts of experimentations going on wouldn't happen in this country gordon absolutely not but um, no, but I think you know. I think it's important for uh, Balcones is, is the is the distillery ah, yes. in Texas that about ten years ago was really um, uh, really doing some interesting stuff and still is. But it, there was there was a really talented distiller there who's now not there. Um, but yeah, there's some really really great whiskies. And then there's also there was this the whole thing was hit slightly a little bit a couple of years ago, if we're honest, because there was a lot of whiskies that were being produced as small batch and. And uh, they were brand names that didn't have distilleries, and it was all being purchased from one big sort of supermarket Ooh. of bourbons that, or, or different whiskies that you can buy off the shelf and package up as your own. And this was in Indiana, I think, and, and this sort of got out, and there was a lot of bourbons and, and uh, other products from distillers that technically were well, they weren't making it themselves, and uh, that caused a little bit of a rumpus ah, as well. Right. So, I can see the um, commercial. That happened about two or three years right. ago. I can see what they're trying to do, but I'm, and that you know you really associate the craft beers uh, industry in the, with, uh, with America, and I can imagine that didn't go down too well. But I'm glad it didn't, Gordon. No. Well, problems. I mean, you think of all the litigation that you can get into in America, and you're like, oh gosh. And I think Maker's Mark was even taken to court a few years ago about using the word handmade, um, mm. and uh, you're like. Crikey. Uh, uh they won i think in the end which was good but uh yeah it was uh yeah i mean but generally there's some amazing stuff out there oh, and uh you can find you can find reviews and things and have a look and a lot of them are available in the uk so Gordon, if I be, um i'm just gonna put you on the spot here because that's what we do mm. that's what we do um oh, a, a running theme I'm, 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 i know you can handle it listillery if we had to oh. put on a an american bourbon stroke whiskey night what would you have lined up? You can name how many whiskies you want. You've got some friends' rounds. Could you put a wee list together of what we'd have to go out and purchase to make that a great night? Yes. Well, okay. You Here need we go. to get some typical... Um, Gordon Dundas's listillery. American you whiskey typical, special. You need to get some typical Kentucky food. Oh, right. This is my, Now you're talking. So, I think you need... Now, cuisine of Kentucky is... Not the KFC, Whoa. not your... Well, no, but, I mean, you can get chicken dumplings, things, you know, chicken and dumplings, hot browns, and pecan pie, and all that stuff. Oh, because... They eat well in Kentucky, let me tell you. Okay. I went to a dinner in the, <laughs> um, the well, there's a very, very famous hotel in Louisville called the Sealback. Now, the Sealback is, it's got a cocktail named after it. It's a very famous hotel in Louisville. The reason it's so famous is it had a really, really... Al Capone used to stay there ah. when he was during during his sort of right. days where he was... Jury, probably during Prohibition Almost where he was um, doing, you know, doing all the stuff that he shouldn't be doing or, or should be doing, whatever way you look at it. Um, and um, he... Um, it was a historic... Founded by some Bavarians, actually. Um, but uh, he used to have secret passages in this hotel where he could hide from the law enforcement who obviously wanted to uh yes. to catch up with him. I, I, yeah i went for dinner there one night and i had a typical great kentucky sort of spread and i didn't eat for about four days afterwards which which was <laughs> it was a significant uh spread so you need to get buy into okay. that food right. style food that's that's good food it, it's, it's, it's fundamentally part of kentucky right okay you can maybe give the fried chicken a miss from the from the massive chain um <laughs> Um, and then really what I would look at is, you know, a lot of bourbons really, really, you know, bourbon as a style is much more in your face. It's sweeter, it's bolder than scotch. It's not as, it's not as, um, it's not as um, subtle in a way. I mean, mm-hmm. you wouldn't describe maybe some peated scotches as subtle, but you know what I mean. Uh, so the flavors are a bit more apparent. They're a bit more in your mouth or in your face. 
I mean, a bourbon walks in the room and goes, hey, I'm a bourbon, hi. <laughs> Scotch, a single malt walks in the room if it's a sort of unpeated one and goes, hi, how are yep. you? How are you doing? Yep. Yep. Mo- mo- you know, that's the sort of difference. So, you know, but bourbons what? are made to mix. It's, you know, your standard bourbons, people want to mix them. They'll mix them, drink, put ice in them. You know, there's no none. Of, you don't have to have a Glencairn glass and all this. It's not about that. And you can do that with scotch as well. Of so course. So we're going to get some tumblers. Mixers, mixers, mixers and mixers, tumblers. Tumblers, ice, lots of good ice. Ice. And uh, then you need some bluegrass music. Okay, bluegrass. Sort of a bit of uh, a bit of famous bluegrass music. Um, maybe even a little bit of um, just country and western. Similar, but bluegrass yeah. music is really, really Copyright precludes from me from putting it on world. here. There's now, sadly, yeah, yeah. I would have some. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then just for a bit of, you know, general Americanism, a bit of ZZ Top, something like that. Okay. Um, uh, and then you're pretty much ready to go. Um, I mean, you could get the cowboy hat, should you wish. Um, and um, you can get the sort of check shirt. And uh, you could, if you really wanted to go whole hog, um, you could hire a rodeo thing. Oh, I like that. Um, and any shout in the biskies? Would you just, just grab four or five from different... Yeah, look, I would just... If you've never regions. really done bourbon before and you want to try something a bit different at home, you know, there's some great bourbons out there. There's so many different ones to try. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, um, all of these... You know, all the main producers produce some really good stuff, high-strength stuff. Um, they'll also produce rye and a whole range of different things. But there's also a load of independent ones to seek out and try. So I probably wouldn't mention any in particular. But right. my sort of go-to bourbon is, uh, I love a Maker's Mark. Um, and I, as I said, I did used to work for them. But uh, I and just think it's a really good bourbon. Work, um, work your way towards the spicy. Work your way towards the rise. Would that? Well, you could do, yeah. But I mean, you know, I had a, you, try a Rittenhouse rye. Try a Bullet rye. Try a, you know, they're not what you think they are. They're actually full of really, really great flavours. And they're not as peppery as everybody thinks. So... Um, you know that was my uh, so j- and, and then try a f- 100% corn whiskey or try a there's a whole range of whiskies to try um, from America so oh, that's uh, after, we've tried to give you a bit of a breakdown but it's totally just get it out there and don't say I d- just don't think I don't like bourbon you know Gordon we're coming up almost for the hour mark here just now so um, a little American special it oh, ha- has yeah. been with not I mean you have been an absolute mine of information uh, in this episode Gordon I have to say it's absolutely fascinating and Preston was a star as well so thank you for bringing Mr Van Winkle to the table not at all not at all and uh, um, you know he's you know it's a great category it's a great whiskey just if you've never tried it get out there and try it you'll love it um, and and now what we also see is a lot of bourbon drinkers are moving to Scotch because they that barrier doesn't exist anymore. People are much more like, yeah, let's give it a go, you know. And that's what you should be like in whiskey. Let's go and try new things. It's a bit like, oh, I've never had a peated whiskey. Go and try it. You might love it. That's and the amount of people that do on their first attempt go, oh, I do love a peated whiskey. Similar, similar attitude. That's absolutely fascinating. It's a really great way to finish there. A yeah. very optimistic no, view of the world of whiskey. We're all in it together and trying each other's whiskies it's a, a, a much better world Gordon Dundas can I bring the curtain down on episode 9 our American whiskey bourbon special you can but we also need to say we've probably only got what three episodes left before Christmas yes we have. three episodes left before Christmas we're probably going to look at we haven't really obviously scripted this at all and I'm just now making this up as we go <laughs> yes, but we're looking at maybe doing one live yeah we are um, on <laughs> YouTube, um, which means that it could be a complete disaster, but we'll see how that goes. Um, we're looking at what other guests will get on before the end of the year. Yeah, we're also looking maybe into how you would start a distillery. We, we looked at that a little bit with um, with um, yes. you and Mitchell, but yeah. we're, we're, I think we're going to speak to one or two others who, who have done it. I know. And uh, we'll tell us about it. Yep, yep. Um, no, insider's uh, Guide. I've got a few lined up for the Insider's Guide as well, because yeah, we, you know, we, we are producers. We like to speak to people actually physically make it. So I've got a couple of these people lined up too. And I know that, and, and just to finally summarise, again, we've had a lot of correspondence, one email, about um, <laughs> about the A to Zs. And I think we should try and finish the A to Zs by the end of the year. Right, okay. Right, right, that's good. good. I can't even remember where we are. Where are we are? Uh, we on R. We're at R. Q, oh, oh, Q, Q last week, and then Q, R. So Q, R. So R. 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 Yeah, we could do the rest of them by the end of the end, of the, and then we'll have completed the alphabet by Christmas, 
um, and it would all be beautifully packaged up to restart next year. Yes. Excellent. So there we go. Excellent. We have got three left. Three left. Good. If you want to influence anything we talk about, uh, please contact us um, social yeah. media and through the uh, Podbean account as well where we can uh, speak to you. Gordon Dundas! Yeah. Let's bring it to a close with humming the theme tune from Star Wars. <laughs> Go on, <laughs> do it. No, it's Superman! Um, <laughs> st- 